Welcome back to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. My name is Wayne Kimmel, managing partner of 76 Capital, the sports tech venture capital company. And on this show, I have the opportunity and quite frankly, the honor to interview top athletes and entrepreneurs who are truly shaping and many times truly changing the sports business industry. Today, we're gonna to talk the world of sports business we're going to have an even amazing guest. Her name is Shayna Stevenson. She is the chief brand officer of the WNBA's New York Liberty. Shayna, welcome to our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Well, really excited to have you on our show. Um, I can't wait to sort of dive into your career, all the great things that you've done to become the chief brand officer of the the W, right? The of, of the W. Yeah, the W. Real fans call it the W, so I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you know, let's get into it right away. I mean, like, tell tell us about you know what you do, you know, for the for and with the New York Liberty and all the exciting things that you get to do as the chief brand officer. Sure. So I'm approaching my fifth season with the team. Um, I formally joined the team in 2018 as a consultant. I was working for myself at the time and the now CEO of the team. Um, well, I was introduced to the now CEO of the team by a former boss of mine that I worked with at ESPN. At the time, she was the CMO at uh, Madison Square Garden, and she thought that I would be helpful to the Liberty in terms of, you know, leading their marketing. And so I came on as a consultant in 2018 and the team was a bit in flux at the time. Um, Jim Dolan had just put the team up for sale and relocated them out to Westchester County Center. And so the team was really operating with a skeleton crew. And so that's why it made sense to hire a consultant to manage the marketing aspect of the business. Um, so that season um, was my first with the team. And as a New Yorker, I'm from New York. So it was really like a dream job for me to work for a team that I grew up rooting for. Um, obviously, it's women's sports. And in my career, I've really done um, a lot of work within the women's sports space. Space. I'm big on advocating and promoting women's sports, also promoting women um, athletes of color. So working with the WNBA, where the league is 80 percent black women, that was like just, you know, life's work, passion filled work. Um, so yeah, so I did that. And then once the team was bought um, by Joe and Clara Tsai, who also co-own the uh, Brooklyn Nets, and the decision was made to move to Brooklyn, um, it made a lot of sense for me to just stay on board. Um, and, and luckily Kia, who's our CEO, offered me the opportunity to come on full time. So um, yeah, so this will be my fifth season with the team. Last season was our first in Brooklyn. And it's been a really exciting journey because we've, you know, we have a lot to do in terms of reestablishing our brand within New York City. Um, we're 26 years in, which is huge for women's sports. The WNBA and the New York Liberty as an original team celebrated its 25th anniversary last season. And not, there's no other women's professional sports league that can say that they've been around for 25 years. Um, so we take a lot of pride in that as being an, an original franchise, but recognize that there's still a lot of growth opportunity within, um, you know, for the Liberty, for the WNBA within New York. And as someone who, you know, loves marketing, it's really an honor to be challenged to be the one to help reestablish that identity of this team within New York City, um, but in a different borough, right? How does that look differently from them playing at Madison Square Garden? How are we reaching out to fans that we've lost over the couple, you know, the past couple of seasons because we were relocated to Westchester County Center. Oh, and then we spent a season in the bubble <laughs> down in Florida. And, you know, so it, it's really great. It's exciting. We have some wonderful talent on our team. Um, Sabrina Ionescu, who was the number one overall pick last season, Benai Jelani was on the all-star team, Michaela Onyewede just won rookie of the year. So the pieces are there and we have a really strong foundation that we're building on. So I take it, um, you know, I count it as a blessing and, and see it as a huge responsibility to be the one tasked to, again, reestablish that identity, reestablish that brand within um, a new borough. 
Well, it's really amazing. You know, I've had the opportunity and, and quite frankly, the honor to um, have Val Ackerman also um, mm -hmm. on the show, you know, the first president of, of the W back in the yeah, you know, yeah. when it first started. And, you know, she was tapped by David Stern to go, you know, do that. And and, and she just talks about how proud she is of, of what's what's happened um, over all of these years now. And, you know, and you're you're one of those you know, executives with the, you know, the, the opportunity to continue to really build the brand uh, of, of the league and certainly of, 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 of the team. So, you know, tell me about sort of not only the responsibility there, but kind of what does it mean for you to have the opportunity to actually um, to, to, to really, you know, to, to, to continue to push forward um, all, all the things that, you're, that are happening with the team and with the league? Honestly, it's a dream job of mine. You know, as I mentioned, the league is 80% black women. So to see myself in these players um, and to see the talent, the commitment, everything that they endure from the positive to the negative, um, to be someone who's helping reshape what that means for this league and what that means for these athletes, I, I, I you know, see that as an honor. I see it as a responsibility. It's not something that I um, take for granted at all. I think, you know, the WNBA and its athletes have, have received a lot of recognition for the work that they do on the court, of course, but more so off the court as well. And, you know, being able to flip Senate seats and just raise awareness for social matters, racial justice, gender equality, equal pay, all of the issues that, you know, plague our society at large, I always speak about the WNBA as being a microcosm of a lot of the social issues that we recognize in our society every single day, right? So whether it's, um, you know, be an activist for pride, you know, the LGBTQ plus community, being a voice for racial equality, you know, raising, um, shining a light on gender equity issues that we have in our society. Um, you know, within the latest CBA, they included a term um, that allows women to freeze their eggs or um, take more, you know, have more benefits and resources towards becoming a mother, right? The challenges that women face experiencing motherhood. So these women really represent um, the heart and soul of a lot of issues in which we need to continue to fight for to get better and, you know, have more equity, have more equality that we see every day um, in in cities like New York and, and just across the country overall. So to be a part of this movement um, that I feel that our athletes are so integral in driving um, is important to me and to give our athletes a platform to share their experiences, to share their, their voices, to um, raise awareness for the causes and the issues that matter to them and, and not silence them, like help amplify that for them and encourage them is great. But then also there's the basketball aspect of it, right? And and this is why I got into sports in the first place. I grew up a huge sports fan. I'm a daddy's girl. And growing up as a New Yorker, you know, Knicks in the 90s were life. Um, a Yankees fan. I'm also a Jets fan. So, you know, n not so many great days being a Jets fan then or now. But, um, you know, I'm a, like I said, I'm a daddy's girl. So every Saturday morning in the 90s, like we would go to the basketball court and he would teach me the ins and outs of the game. And that's how I became addicted to sports. I remember us staying up late at night to watch less than a minute of Mike Tyson fights on, you know, on TV or um, and I'm dating myself by by saying all of this. But I also recall like for the say the NBA draft or the NFL draft, buying the newspaper in the morning and at that time, they would print out, um, you know, the projected draft classes of, you know, where they thought that it would go, where, you know, each player would go. And I would literally sit on my couch with the newspaper and have the TV on and watch as they were announced, like hand write who was, you know, if the draft order was correct, scratch out the names that were wrong. Um, so I've always 
been a nerd in that way around sports. I've always, you know, there was, I always over consume sports in any form or fashion that I could. Um, you know, I was the person that would start in the, in the back of the newspaper first and start with reading the sports pages first and then flip to the front and read, you know, and catch up on the news from the day before. Um, so I've always been about it, um, for that reason. And so to be able to go to a WNBA game and watch the greatest women professional basketball players in the world compete night in and night out and call it work is, you know, it doesn't get any better than that for me. Well, I love how you talked you talked about and, and described yourself as a daddy's girl. And I, I hope that my daughter feels the same way. She's in college now. And, you know, I, 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 and I could say this, I hope my son doesn't watch or, or listen to this episode, but I'll tell you, you know, when my daughter, I got to coach my daughter with some of my friends and we won the eighth grade championship, right? That was the biggest moment in, for, for me in basketball. So that was, was so great to see, you know, all the girls and, and, you know, play and, and, and do so well and, and come together after so many years of, of tough, we had, a, we had a number of tough years. When you see and, and you get the opportunity to be up close and personal with some of the best professional athletes in the world, as you said, that are, that are in the W today, what are some of the things that you think that make them so successful? Are there certain traits that they have? Are there certain things that you see that enable them to be as great as, the, as, as they are? I think it's um, similar to most athletes, just like dedication, discipline. Obviously, their athleticism is out of this world. But, you know, at some point, they really had to commit to their craft and say, this is what I want to do with my life and I want to be the best at it. Um, you know, there's countless stories of athletes who are, you know, top 100 when they're in high school and then they go to college and they kind of lose themselves. And, you know, the athleticism that everyone saw for them or the hype that everyone saw for them doesn't materialize for a number of reasons. But I think it starts with them just making that promise to themselves, that commitment to themselves that this is really something that I want to pursue and I'm going to be the best at it and not letting anything deter them or take them off track. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming those are some of the exact same things that, that you look for or that you do yourself, I'm sure, you know, in, in your role. Um, but at the same time, for people that are on your team, um, in, on, the, on the brand and marketing side of things, um, you're, you're, you're looking for people that are, are really dedicated and love what they do and, 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 and have that, that extra, that almost that extra gear, right, that you need to kind yeah. of to, to be the best. Yeah, for sure. I am um, not proud of this. I have a reputation for being a tough boss. Um, <laughs> my boss often says that, you know, I demand excellence of myself and others, which I would agree with. And sometimes people can't handle it. I think, you know, sports is a very sexy industry, but it isn't until you get in it that you realize how hard the job is, how late the days are, how many hours, you know, you're in the arena, you're on your feet, you're problem solving, you're catering to these athletes, you're running around, you know, an arena. I don't even know how large the arena is, but from one side to the other. And so that's a lot, you know, and I don't think people see that or they don't see that, you know, the game ends at 10 or nine and then there's media avail and yes you have to stay up and, and clip those clips and make sure that highlights are available on social media or you know press conference remarks are up on social media and if that takes you until one two o'clock in the morning that takes you until one or two o'clock in the morning and then yes if there's practice in the next day and you need to be there at 7 a.m then you need to be there at 7 a.m and i think you know people don't think about that reality of sports they think about just showing up and being able to watch the game which yeah that's part of it too but honestly i can't tell you how many games i've been at and haven't even watched because i'm running around and doing so many other things right so there are that there there are those times where the work outside of 
the you know first through fourth quarter that you have to focus on takes over what's actually happening on the court. Um, and that can be grueling for some people and 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 not everyone is built for it. And so you sw- you you quickly learn, you know, if you have the muscle to power through it or not, and if you'll survive in this business. And you know, the W, we have 36 games. I couldn't imagine working for MLB or working for the NBA, you know, like that. Oh my gosh. So if you, if you're, if you're inundated and and feeling overwhelmed by the schedule of the WNBA, then you should really rethink if this industry um, overall is something that you have the, the fortitude to, to really succeed in. Well, you know, you've been in this role um, with the, with the Liberty um, now for five years, you said, and mm-hmm. a lot's changed. I mean, you, you talked about, you know, th- go from the garden now in, in Brooklyn. Um, we went through or we're going through this global pandemic, which must have been so tough um, in so many ways, the bubble, et cetera. But a lot's also changed from a marketing and branding perspective social media, crypto, NFTs, you know, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, all this new tech that has come into this world, just social media in general. How much of that has affected your job and has it made your, is it, has it really expanded your role within the organization? For sure. I, I'll say this morning I had a call about NFT um, and we're planning something soon. Um, so that's been dominating a lot of, you know, our conversations lately and just trying to get up, you know, caught up to speed on what is it, how should we approach it, um, all that stuff. But I, you know, I love learning and I love all of these, you know, emerging media and tech um, developments because it, it allows me to continue to stay on top of it, to continue to remain a student and, and, and yeah, I'm I'm always just trying to become as knowledgeable about new things and new ways of marketing and messaging um, to our fans and audiences as much as I can. Um, so NFT coming soon, you know. That's all I'll say is you know we're we're exploring stuff there. Um, TikTok is an area in which we, as a team, haven't really focused a lot of our efforts on, but it's something that I'm making more of a priority for this season. Um, it's important, you know, our fans, the core fan base has been with us since day one. Um, but it's really, um, important for us to continue to expand and grow and reach, you know, a younger generation. Right. And so that's where they are. We have to meet the fans where they are. And so that's something that I'm hyper focused on and in, in this soft season as well. And I think just technology overall, it's really great specifically for our, our league where our games are not on prime time as much as, other professional sports leagues are right and so but we have had the the opportunity to have games on amazon to have games on facebook and on um twitter and again that makes it easier for the fans to find our games and that opens them opens up opens us up to more fans as well and that's how people are consuming sports now everyone's not you know watching tv everyone doesn't have um cable anymore. So using streaming platforms to also distribute our games, I think is really important. And it's opening up, opening us up to um, being able to capitalize off of broadening, broadening our fan base. So I think tech has been a huge addition and, you know, value to the growth of the WNBA. And then social media, I just love how our fans, I'm sorry, our players are, using those platforms and engaging with those platforms because it shows another side of them, Um, you know, just their personality, a day in a life of, fans feel closer to these athletes in a way that we as a team can't necessarily convey to them. So I love that. Um, I love to see that our players are taking more control of their voice and their narratives and, and curating that on their own. 
Well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you have, uh, I'm sure, your team that does the social media side for the team. But then, you know, today, as we know, the power of the athletes, the power of their social media um, networks and, and, and their followers and how that, you know, really impacts and, and, and really lifts up the team brand, the league brands. Um, and and how do you work together with them um, in, in what they do and is, is or do you work with with the players themselves? Yeah, we do. Yeah. So we're it's great to be in New York because we don't being in New York, you're in a very liberal city. Right. And so there's not much that our players may want to express that we're going to say, no, maybe we shouldn't touch that. Maybe, you know, I don't know. We don't support that. Um, so when athletes come to us and they they say that these are issues that are really important to them, we find a way to work with them to amplify that. Um, we have one player, Jocelyn Willoughby, who in 2021 um, decided she wanted to start a book club and focus on books that centered women of color and racial identity, um, prison reform, you know, like really heavy hitting subjects. And we said, OK, let's do it. And so she formed the book club and we worked with her to host the book club. And um, we reached out, you know, our PR team reached out to the authors of these books. And she had uh, conversations with the authors of each book that she selected on our IG live. Um, so even if you weren't in the book club, which was hosted via Zoom and was private, you would be able to have this public conversation or tune into this public conversation with one of our players and, you know, a best Nike, New York Times bestselling author. Um, and, you know, we're we're working on launching season two of that. So that's an example of ways in which our athletes come to us and express a desire or, or something that they want to do and how we can support them in, in return of doing that. Um, another example is of, you know, one of our players, Dee Dee Richards, she um, is famously known for, for suffering a, a traumatic injury in which she was paralyzed last October. And then she was drafted overall in um, the first round of the WNBA. And to further that, she made all rookie team last season. And her story is one that people admire. You know, it's a, it's a story of triumph. It's a story of coming back. But she's, quite frankly, like, overtelling that story now. But what um, drives her now and what her main purpose is is mental health and raising, and raising awareness for mental health issues. And so we work with her to figure out ways in which she can be a public advocate for that. Um, and so an opportunity arose with CBS Morning News where Brandon Marshall and Kevin Love um, um, joined Nate Burleson and they discussed mental health, right? So again, another way in which we support the issues that matter to our players by saying, you can either use our platform or we'll find other platforms to help you communicate and tell those stories. Those are great examples and really interesting. I mean, you know, and we talk about, we were talking about kind of the, all the new things that are coming down the pike and how could we not, you know, talk about the fact that now mobile sports betting is legal uh, across the state of New York now. And this will be your first season um, at, at the Barclays Center where people can be sitting in their seats and, and betting on your games. Um, how do you feel about that? And are there things that you're, our partnerships that you're d developing right now and, and ways of uh, how, how this will be integrated into the into the overall game experience. I think it's great. I think it again, like we're all about the growth. Right. And so sports betting is one of those things where if you have money on the line, you're going to care more about the outcome of this game or more about the performance of a particular player. And I think overall, it'll just drive more eyeballs to our sport. I think about, you know, fantasy sports and when that launched all those years ago and how 
people became more avid fans because they had a, a rooting interest in the outcomes of these players' performances. And I think we'll see a similar effect with sports betting um, in the WNBA. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we love to do on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show is to also, you know, hear from, from our guests, you know, was there a someone in their life that truly, you know, you mentioned a, your daddy's girl, so that, that's, a, that's a big thing. Was, was, the, was it your dad or were there other people in your life that inspired you to become what you are today? Yeah, it's my dad. Um, <laughs> Um, outside of family, Dr. Charles Jeter, De Derek Jeter's father. So Derek Jeter's sister, Charlie, and I went to college together. And so we've known each other since we were 18 years old and we became fast friends. And when I left ESPN to work for myself, her father was someone that I would often call often. I would often call and ask for advice and I didn't know what I was doing, but he was a great resource and, and it's someone I could still call today. Um, when I see him, um, it's always, you know, just like, hey, Dr. Cheater. He always still sees me as this little 18 year old that he met um, in college back in Atlanta, Georgia. But he was someone that um, no matter where I was or, you know, what stage I was in, in my journey, that I know that if I called him, he would have something really insightful to offer me. Or if he felt that he didn't have direct knowledge of what I was going through, that he would connect me with someone else that did. And so that's been um, a really great, um, it's just been really great to have someone like him who obviously, you know, had such an impact on, on Derek's life and my friend Charlie's life is like, able to impact me as well. You know, when you look at the the world of sports, and you just mentioned the NFL division playoffs, which were just unbelievable, and yeah. it seemed like everyone that you knew was glued to the TV on Saturday and Sunday watching those games, and all the incredible things that are happening in the sports world today. Um, even from a gaming perspective, I mean, Microsoft spends $75 billion to buy Activision. So the gaming and esports side of the world is, 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 is going. You've got sports betting. We talked about NFTs. We can't wait to see what you're doing on that. Um, but when you think about, you know, 2022 and what's going to happen uh, the rest of this year, um, are there certain things that maybe you know will be happening or things that you say, wow, it would be really amazing if such and such happened? Or, you know, what if this really big tech company or this really big, you know, you mentioned ESPN, what's ESPN going to do next or something like that? Are there certain things that you say, hey, I, I think potentially this really big thing's going to happen that's going to make the sports world and sports industry even bigger than it is today? Ooh, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. You know, I I just love the way that the sports industry continues to evolve. Um, and athletes continue to play a role in that as well. When you think about how um, athletes are becoming investors in a lot of these tech spaces, a lot of these endeavors. I think about, you know, um, Steph Curry and KD and, you know, so many athletes, to be honest, um, really taking ownership in shaping the future of sport for the fan, but also the athlete. Um, Sabrina Ionescu has a ton of investments as well, Naomi Osaka. So I love to see women athletes also um, getting their slice of the pie um, in, 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 in shaping the future in the evolution of sport. One new tech company that I'm really excited about is Buzzer. Have, are you familiar with Buzzer? Absolutely. And with Bo and, and his Bo, team. Bo. Yeah. <laughs> so I love what they're doing. Um, 
I met Bo when he was at Twitter. Um, and so to see just the growth in such a short time and he's an immigrant and, you know, comes from an immigrant family. So I love that aspect of his story, but then also like, he's just a good person. Um, and faith is at the center of everything that he does. And, and, you know, and, and knowing a lot of people that work with him and for him, understanding that they share similar values, but at the same time, Sports and, and making it more accessible to folks is really at the core of his business. So I'm really excited to see the future of Buzzer and how that that begins to take off. So where can we where can we um, check you out personally, whether that's on uh, on on social media or the team and where can we find and, and watch over the next several months all these exciting things? Yeah, so I would say follow the team at NY Liberty on Twitter and Instagram, um, also on TikTok. Um, those are our main platforms. We're also on Facebook. I think it's New York Liberty on Facebook. Uh, but then personally, I am, it's Shana Renee. So I T S S H A N A R E N E E on Instagram. I'm most active on Instagram. I'm also on Twitter, same handle, but less active, but something that. I'm hoping to change this year. I, I miss um, I miss the engagement. I actually popped in and, and peeked at my personal Twitter um, over the weekend. And I was like, oh, people really are still <laughs> on Twitter. Like I hadn't seen some of the handles. Um, I used to be really, really active on Twitter back in like, 2010 to maybe 2015, 16 ish. Um, but I haven't been as active um, over the past couple of years. But I see that a lot of the people that I used to follow still are. So that was really cool. And I was able to like just kind of see what they've been up to. So I might, I might start um, peeking on Twitter a little bit more, being more active on Twitter a little bit more. So those are the two places you can find me. Well, thank you so much. It's been amazing having you. Shana Stevenson, the Chief Brand Officer for the New York Liberty. Um, amazing to have you on the show. Love your stories. Love all the things that you're doing. And we will definitely keep an eye out for you for this, uh, you know, for this really exciting, you know, 2022 season that's coming up. Thanks so much for joining our show. Thanks for having me. Well, this has been another great episode of our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. We love to bring you really amazing people within the sports business world, and we certainly had one here today. Thanks, everybody. Go out there and go make it happen, and have a great day.